The omnipotence paradox is one of the most famous arguments in the philosophy of religion, which challenges God's omnipotence with a simple question. Could God create a stone so heavy that even he cannot lift it? Many skeptics think it's a decisive argument against the existence of an omnipotent God, but surprisingly, this argument is not popular among academic philosophers, and even some atheists have rejected it. Here's why. Broadly speaking, we can define omnipotence in two ways. The absolutist view holds that omnipotence includes doing absolutely anything, even the logically impossible like creating a perfect circle that is also perfectly square. Western philosophical and theological traditions have almost universally rejected this view and have excluded doing the logically impossible from omnipotence. Let's apply the omnipotence paradox to these two views. The omnipotence paradox alleges that if God can do all things, then he should be able to make a stone he can't lift, but also lift all stones. But since those two actions are mutually exclusive, God can do both. And as a consequence, omnipotence is impossible. First, let's apply this to the absolutist view. Under the absolutist view, God can perform even logically paradoxical actions like create a square circle. If logically paradoxical things could be a part of reality, then the fact that lifting all rocks and making a rock that's unliftable are mutually exclusive is not an objection to God's omnipotence because by definition, logically paradoxical states of affairs could be a part of reality. As Alvin Plantinga puts it, such a god would eat logical paradoxes for breakfast. In fact, it seems the omnipotence paradox only works if we take a conjunction of the following two statements to be both true. Belief A. Omnipotence requires God to do even logically paradoxical things, which is the absolutist view. Belief B. Logically paradoxical things cannot be part of reality, which is a negation of the absolutist view. It's clear that the omnipotence paradox doesn't even get off the ground to challenge omnipotence because even before the argument is presented, it requires a theist to implicitly adopt both the absolutist and non-absolutist view of omnipotence at the same time. What about the mainstream view? The position that omnipotence involves doing the logically impossible has been almost universally rejected by Christian theologians for the past 800 years. For instance, Thomas Aquinas writes that to do all things doesn't include performing logical impossibilities because a square circle is simply not a thing. A square circle is an incoherent pseudo-statement that represents a failure in our language to meaningfully describe something. This should become obvious after a bit of reflection. Suppose someone says, think of something such as a proton, an atom, a mountain, or a galaxy, we immediately know what to think of. Whereas when someone says, think of a square circle, we're left baffled because a square circle is just a string of words. It only purports to represent something because it has two meaningful words in order, but turns out to not correspond to any meaningful mental representation. In view of this, the mainstream position among Christian theologians is that the set of all actions is made up of all logically possible actions because logically impossible actions are not actions, but an incoherent mishmash of words. So immediately, it becomes obvious that the omnipotence paradox fails because on the list handed to us by skeptics of the alleged things that an omnipotent God should be able to do, we find the logical equivalent of a square circle. It's not possible to create a world in which God can both create a stone too heavy for him to lift, and he can lift all stones in existence at the same time. Such a world is logically impossible and not something God is expected to do if he is omnipotent. To affirm otherwise would be to revert to the definition that omnipotence is the ability to make logically impossible things real. Second, the statement that God can create a rock he can't lift is inherently logically contradictory. The only difference between a square circle and God creating a stone he can't lift is that the paradox in the second statement is more cleverly disguised. The following thought experiment from the philosopher Ryan Byerly helps in understanding this inherent paradox. In the thought experiment, Ryan Byerly asks us to imagine that there are two people, a regular person called Joe and a weightlifter. For the purpose of the thought experiment, let's suppose the biggest size stones they can each make is 80 pounds. Suppose the maximum weight Joe can lift is 60 pounds. The weightlifter can easily lift 200 pounds. Because Joe can make a stone which weighs 80 pounds but can only lift 60 pounds, 
Joe has an ability the weightlifter doesn't. He can make a stone he can't lift. But Joe only has this extra ability to make a stone he can't lift because he's physically less powerful than the weightlifter. Some abilities, like the ability to make a stone one can't lift, attest to some inherent weakness, not a power. For instance, the ability to acquire all known infections is not a power, but a weakness. An all-powerful being having the ability to make a stone he can't lift is paradoxical because the term abilities in the English language is ambiguous and can actually be used to refer to weaknesses. Since to be omnipotent is to have all powers, not to have all abilities. Once we understand this distinction, the legs start to come out from under the omnipotence paradox. A simple argument involving two premises shows that the alleged paradox vanishes. Premise 1. An all-powerful being only has powers and has no weaknesses. Premise 2. Creating a stone one can't lift attests to some inherent weakness, not a power. Conclusion from 1 and 2. An all-powerful being shouldn't have the ability to create a stone he can't lift. And so once we lift this veneer from the omnipotence paradox and highlight the false assumptions it contains, the omnipotence paradox vanishes. At this point, we've not given a specific definition of omnipotence. All we've done is defined it in negative terms by excluding doing the logically impossible. So here's one simple, intuitive definition of omnipotence which is completely resistant to all known objections and which has been in use by Christians for almost 2,000 years. A being is omnipotent if it is all-powerful. Seriously, that's it. What does being all-powerful mean? A power of human beings is limited by their inability to execute what they've willed. For instance, I may wish to lift 500 pounds, but I can't make that scenario real. This helps us to intuitively understand what being all-powerful means. Being all-powerful means that God could create the world in any possible way that He wished, and He could not fail to accomplish His goal. Simply rephrasing the above sentence using different words, we get a full definition. Definition 1. Being all-powerful means given all possible ways, the world could be X, if God were to will X, He would bring about X. This definition is consistent with how St. Augustine, St. Aquinas, and other influential philosophers have viewed omnipotence. Let's take a look at how this definition holds up against the two most serious objections to omnipotence. The first objection has been haunting most other definitions of omnipotence since it was introduced by Alvin Plantinga in 1967. Suppose we define omnipotence according to definition 2. X is omnipotent if X can do anything that X wishes. That's also logically possible for X to do. Alvin Plantinga has shown that definition 2 implies the nonsensical consequence that any being who is severely limited in power is omnipotent. To illustrate this point, Plantinga came up with the imaginary being, McEar, who is severely limited in what he can do. He can only do one thing, and he only wants to do one action. Like for instance, to scratch his ears. According to definition 2, McEar qualifies as omnipotent since he could do anything which is logically possible for him to do that he wishes, which is to scratch his ear all day. But obviously an entity who can only do one thing is not omnipotent, so there's something wrong with the definition. This objection undermines most definitions of omnipotence, but not the way Thomas Aquinas understood it. The definition given in this video holds that a necessary requirement for omnipotence is not being able to fail at one's goal. Yet there are possible beings, processes, events, or objects which could prevent McEar from achieving his goal. Someone could just hold McEar's arm to prevent him from doing whatever it is he wants to do. In order for a being to achieve his goal always without failure, that being would have to have control over all the factors which could make him fail. If McEar could control all the causes, processes, objects, events, and beings which could possibly make him fail, he would no longer be limited in power. He would have power over any other entity which could possibly exist. As a consequence, the definition given in this video rules out beings who are severely limited in power from being omnipotent. The last objection is to another common definition of omnipotence, which is definition 3. An omnipotent being should be able to bring about any logical possible state of affairs. Critics allege this definition suffers from a problem. According to the philosopher Augustin Echeverria, there are some logically possible states of affairs which are morally reprehensible, such as lying maliciously, and which a perfectly good being could not bring about. Therefore, there cannot be an omnipotent being who is also perfectly good. There are a couple of reasons why this doesn't undermine omnipotence. For instance, 
Thomas Aquinas defines omnipotence as God is omnipotent if he can bring about logically possible states of affairs that he wishes to bring about. And since being all good doesn't prevent one from bringing about any logically possible states of affairs that one wishes, there's no logical conflict between omnipotence and being perfectly good. A skeptic may object that it makes sense that to be truly all-powerful, God should be able to do morally reprehensible things. But this is not true. We would say a person lacks power when they desire to bring about something, but there are external barriers preventing them they cannot overcome. There are no external barriers which prevent God from creating a world which is morally reprehensible. The constraint on God is due to his own moral goodness. Doing morally reprehensible things would be against God's desires, and if God could perform these actions, that would make God less powerful, not more. For instance, when a drug user complains that despite desperately wanting to cease taking drugs, they are simply physically powerless to resist. We would say that such a person lacks power because they can't act according to what they truly desire to do. In the same way, if God creates worlds in accordance to his desires, this makes him more powerful than a being who would create worlds inconsistent with how he wants them to be. In summary, the traditional concept of omnipotence is the ability to create the world in any possible way that one wants. This concept of omnipotence, which has been in use at least since the time of Thomas Aquinas, is simple, intuitive, and resistant to the omnipotence paradox. Thanks for watching.